Hi, family. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Johannesburg, Johannesburg International Christian, Christian Church. Church. My name is Dr. Andrew Smelly. This is my beautiful wife, Patrick, and it's our privilege to welcome you to today's service. I believe you're in for a treat. We have a very inspiring service for you today. The Grown Walls will be sharing a very powerful yes. and moving communion. And after them, the Ato Hengbeis will convict our hearts Amen. when it comes to contribution. Amen. You know, it's during this time, this week, we celebrate Youth Day. And uh, it's a, a dark chapter in South Africa's history. But I'm so grateful that the church gets to be the light of hope. And even as you listen to the uh, Grunwalds and also at the Hengbe share, you see the diversity of God's kingdom. This is the way it needs to be. The church needs to be the light to the world. Amen. I pray that truly with all of our hearts that uh, we can do that in this generation. Thank you so much for joining us today. You are very welcome. We want to welcome you this morning to our worship service. We're going to lead you in two songs. The first one is Let Us Go and Praise the Lord, which we're going to do in four different languages. And then my brother, Khaleesi, is going to powerfully lead us in Tula Sizwe. Let us go and praise the Lord. 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 My son Ben Tom do me 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 Arien rom rorisa. Arien rom rorisa. Arien rom rorisa. Arien rom rorisa. Como os prestigieron chor. Como os prestigieron chor. Como os prestigieron chor. Como os prestigieron chor. Let us go and praise the Lord. 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 Amen. Amen. Amen, amen, family. We're going to sing a Zulu song to the Sizwe. Tula, 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 siswe. Tula, 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 siswe. Cabo, At this stage, we're going to 
just present the entire service to God in prayer. And today we'll be praying in three different languages. My brother and Khaleesi is going to be praying for us in Zulu. I will be praying for us in Afrikaans. And my brother Josh will be praying for us in English. Let us bow our heads. Baba, na na mukhek sense zaguwe. Unso manja ungulunguli kamanako. Ngwa ekone mandu lumshabu ngasela. Okona na saza mbakona. Jehovah wena umshaba upete esanjansa kubaba. Age kunge nawe. Age konga fanzo nawe. Age kofuto ngani mansa nawe ungulunguli nanga leskati. Si azeski sasa si Jehovah pamu psoba kubaba. Si tichatu dumo na kungwele na denga tingo si amazuru. Baba Jehovah si azuti agu kofiki we pamu psoba kuko. Waze chule ngo inkizio zetu na sengundo nzetu baba. Na na muda nanga leskati ngo si nigeli banda si nigeli nkonzo pamu psoba kuko Jehovah. Si nigeli kungwele gu enango si amakosi. Skule nigeli ba kungwele soma na skule lukfana na we skule nigeli kambi psoba kuko Jehovah. Si si ze baba inkizio na sengundo nzetu baba singa pamu gu ekhambe ngo. Baba sizi baba ngosu kwa sambi kate pambu wako Sinenzi siko so kwa bandu basendulo Aba pambu kwa mwene chofa Nibugu laga lwa kongosi ya makosi Lekele kumakosa sendulo Ayo nenzo mlungi ni pambu kwa soba kwa chofa Mau sizi baba ngosu kwa zinzo zetu Zinga fani na benza unga lungleyo Baba si sizi ngosu ya mazuri Kwa silifuzi undu Si hambi so kwa lwa pambu kwa chofa Silifuzi ngekizi yo nange zenzo baba Singa hambi so kwa batugisi baba Singa shuma eli vangeli Kepa ngosi ya makosi zenzo zetu Ziku Tena wena inkizi yoze chuzi kwenye wene chofa Baba sikulegelu mdwele ebanjeni Sikulegelu kwe saba wena ngosi Sikulegelu kona bako nukulu bako chofa Mkumbula baba ngosi chofa Iwu ndu lene spamba wene ngosi chama kosi Lakala ngosi nade ngachi kukona bako Psuwa mdwena chofa Kepa baba ngosi haba ndu bana muta Haba sakali baba nama bema sabonu kuti Upkona bako se psugi le gugibo ngosi chama kosi Nenga yo ngenzika kwa bako chofa Nia kulega chofa Ukuba si libanta baba si nigele pambo uso bako Umdwele bako magube kona tina na ngaso songi skati. Masa nga hambi nane hiyo tu ndela nga pande wako ngosu ya makosi. Nkumbu la baba utavite baba eti maekele ngosu ya mkete ni baba shofa. E ashile kone. Eti maekule ka baba ngosu ezo pume yo pila na nembi. Utela kwe na imvu ume baba shofa. Utu uma ngosu zo hamba nami baba ngzagu ya lapo. Gepa wena ngosu umu ngeko shofa. Angi yugu ya. Na kona kukwambi isa baba ngosu ya mazuru kutu. Uya babaza, uya mchabile elu kona bako ngosu ya mazuru. Baba chiova mausenga aminati, usingati, kuko konge sikuenza ayo. Sikulegela kwenye kamila kwa baba. Ngoba siti ageko fana nawe. Sikulegela manda wako ne sanja sako ngosu ya mazuru. Ukuba tulise zongi vung vung na wongu mwaya chiova. Ube kona pangu wetu, ulalele ngosu. Amazu wetu, sikala wena. Siyazu baba, kasifane legiri ngosu ya makosu. No kuwa sana kubiza siku tumise nge nga yukona wetu Kepa chuova siya kulegele ngosu ya mazulu Uwa wekisa umdwele bako bube pegu wetu baba ngosu ya mazulu Uwa tumise wena ngulu ngulu tumise gayo Age kumu nyonga fane niso ni wale nganswa nawe Eka mela ko ilitene mdwele baba nga kutanda Amen Amen We hear ons God baie dankie vir verochen Dankie dat ons by I kan wees voor die voete kan kom En net dankie sê vir alles wat jy vir ons doen Heere, ons wil net bid vir al die mense wat syk is in die wereld, die mense wat dier die pandemie geraak is, heere, wat syk geword het, ons bid dat hulle genees sal wees. Heere, ons bid vir al die dokters, dat hulle sal opkom met een manier om die COVID-19 te vech, heere. God, ons wil net dank sê vir al die mense in die kerk, vir wie ons al gebid het, wat gezond geword het, en vir die wat nog steeds syk is, heere, ons bid dat hulle genees sal wees. Vader, ons bid vir die tijd in die land waar dis winter in Suid-Afrika en baie mense word syk dier die griep en dan boon op dit dat ons nou nog steeds die COVID-19. Ek bid hier dat dit ons nie sal affecteer nie hier, dat ons gezond sal bly en ons wil net dankie sê hier, jy is die almachtige genees hier en jy sal na ons kyk as ons daarvoor vraag. Blad jou hand op ons rus vandag as een kerk En weer eens vir ons net dankie sê hier, ons is verskrikkelijk lief vir jou, het is in Jesus naam wat ek bid, Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father God, we thank you so much for this time. It is great just hearing my brothers pray, Father, for the holiness and for the health of the church, Father. And we pray for the harvest, God, that, that in this time, Father, more people will reach out to you and mm -hmm. see you for who you truly are, Father. I pray that the gospel may spread throughout all of South Africa and through this continent, God, and through the world at this time, Father, so that a true love, Father, and a true unity uh, can come to us, Father. And I pray that day in and day out, Father, that we don't forget uh, to just obey the, 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 the greatest command, 
which is not just to, to love you, Father, and to love one another, Father, as we love ourselves, Father. I pray that we can truly have a heart for our neighbors, Father. And I pray that as people are coming to you, Father, that we can have men and women of integrity, Father. Men and women who really want to worship you the way you want to be worshipped, Father. Men and women, Father, who, who want to flee from deceit, Father, and flee from the evil that entices this world, Father, and pursue righteousness, Father, and holiness, Father. Thank you so much for this time. It is great to be able to worship with you this morning, Father. Be with us, God, Father. Be with the rest of the, ser the, the service, Father. Be with the communion sharing, Father. Be with the contribution and be with the message. Be with us, Father, as we, as we worship and help us to just draw closer to you, Father, as the day goes by, God. We love you, God. We thank you so much for this time. It is truly great uh, to be able to fellowship in your warmth, Father. We love you. We thank you so much. We pray all of this in your son's name. Amen. 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 morning family uh, we've come to a time in the service where we take the communion together it's a time where we remember the death burial and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ we're going to read this morning from Ephesians chapter 2 if you would turn there so long please my name is Jacques Renovat this is my amazing wife and um, we have a privilege of sharing today thank you so much Andrew and Patrick um, most know about the terrible recent events in the US where a race-based murder was committed by a police officer. Um, both Janine and I, being from an Africana background, want to share what the cross means um, to us as far as South Africa is concerned, and not so much as far as what's happening in other countries. Um, if you would uh, read along with me from verse 11 in Ephesians chapter 2. Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth, and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, who once were far away, have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. Who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. You know, this is amazing. This passage in context is really talking about the dividing uh, wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. It says that in Christ, through dying on the cross, the two were being brought and made one, by uh, taking away this dividing wall, this barrier of hostility. You can imagine people becoming disciples, one from a Jewish background and one from a Gentile background. The potential for clashes. But it's so amazing that the scriptures say that all hostility has been removed in Christ. You know, um, in a way it relates to us as well as far as racial background is concerned. For the first time in my life, when I visited the Church of Disciples back in 2003, I was blown away when I first saw the diversity uh, of the people and their love for God and one another. It was this principle that attracted me to become a disciple. At this time, I would love for Jeanette to share. Thank you so much. Yeah, I agree with Jock. I remember the first time I went to church. It was a Wednesday evening, mm -hmm. about six, 700 disciples together all people from all walks of life and it just really, really deeply impacted me. I've never seen anything like it before. 
you know, but as Jock shared, we are South African. Um, we had the privilege to grow up in the new South Africa, um, the democratic South Africa, and uh, I was 10 when our government changed and we became democratic. And I remember voting day very well. It was the first time my sister and I were home alone uh, for a long time. Uh, and I remember post-election, I remember uh, Nelson Mandela becoming our president. And uh, what an honor just to say yeah. that I saw, I lived when he was alive. <laughs> Um, you know, I remember words like Simunye, we are one, echoing over the television sets. I remember these t-shirts we wore with these mm -hmm. big uh, letters, um, uh, you know, spelling out peace. I remember words like, we're a rainbow nation. Mm -hmm. And I remember deeply impacting me as a young child. And, um, you know, recent events in the U.S. really saddened my heart. Um, because of similarities in South Africa today, um, where there's a, a degree of uh, reverse racism uh, in South Africa. Um, you know, I could relate with a lot of the just feelings of um, injustice, um, and I also could relate with the, the desire to retaliate. Um, and um, it's, it, it pained me to see some responses um, in God's kingdom because of that. And um, that's why I bring up, um, you know, the t-shirt, the, the things I remember as a, as a young child, because um, it could not be tolerated anymore in South Africa. Racism couldn't continue. Um, you know, we, we, we have the same love. We should have the same love. We should have the same standards based on the scriptures. And we're expected to love as disciples the same way as Christ, irregardless of our ethnic backgrounds or our experiences. You now, when we became disciples, we, we left that uh, in the world and we became a new person. You know, we cannot love or live like Jesus, sister if we tolerate prejudice in our hearts, if we have unforgiveness because of the past, or if we even harbor bitterness because of injustice. We cannot tolerate that in God's kingdom, but we can choose to change instead. Yeah. We can love and accept one another because Christ died for all of us. And that dividing wall has been broken down and we can be one because of the Holy Spirit. You know, and at the foot of the cross, we're all equal That's sinners. Right. None of us deserve forgiveness or this life in Christ that we've been given. And I really want to ask the sisters today to examine your heart and to see if there's any part of your heart where there could be unforgiveness or bitterness or a retaliation based on any racial experiences that you may have encountered. Um, so that we can truly be one and fight for that unity because the cost is too great not to. Amen. No, thank you so much. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I was blown away by the love uh, that a diverse group of disciples had for one another. Uh, when I studied the Bible, I had to repent of my own obvious uh, prejudice, uh, and, and that in itself was an incredible miracle. Um, I was baptized as a sold-out disciple in 2003, and I can honestly say that a number of my closest friends today are from a different racial background. Mm -hmm. um, you know, very interesting that Jesus, in a way, got crucified because of prejudice himself. And many have suffered injustice uh, at the hands of people of a different race that no one may understand. But one thing is sure, uh, no one suffered what Jesus did. Uh, Jesus can understand, though. Uh, but the question is, what do I do with this amazing kingdom that has the divisions broken down inside of it? Number one, I must stay repentant of prejudice in my life. And number two, I must defend what is right and not defend any group based on their background. This uh, dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles and equally between races uh, uh, today 
um, is what gives us the amazing kingdom. Let us remember what Christ did on the cross for us and examine our own hearts. Please bow your heads with me as we pray together. Father, uh, thank you for your incredible act of uh, saving grace on the cross that uh, brought us all together, Father. Uh, it moves my heart so much to be unified with people from um, diverse backgrounds, Father. Thank you, Father, that there's no classification racially in the kingdom. There's only the classification of disciples. Mm -hmm. Father, as we reflect on our lives and we look into our hearts, please bless the bread which resembles your son's body and the juice which resembles the blood that he spilled for us. In your son's name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And He will lift you up. And He will lift you up. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, that saved a wretch like me. Once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was blind, but now I see. Death and thousand years. When we've been there ten thousand years. When we've been here ten thousand years. When we've been there ten thousand years. Bright shine. Days to sing God's praise. We no less days to sing God's praise. We no less days to sing God's praise. We no less days to sing God's praise. Than when, than when we first begun. Than when, than when we first we begun. begun. So humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Side of the Lord, yourself in the side of the Lord, and He, and he will, lift will lift you up, and He, and he will, will lift, lift you up. Wow. What a convicting communion sharing by Jack and Jeanette Grunwell. Thank you for really convicting us on what communion should be and um, what it means to you. Um, my name is Osas and this is my wonderful wife, um, Ariel. And um, we're here to share about contribution because um, this is the time of the service where we as disciples you know, give our pledge. And we're also here to share our convictions on why we even give in the first place. Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to be reading from verses 8 to 9. Now, from this scripture first, just giving you background, Paul, you know, is convicting the church in Corinth, you know, to, to excel in giving, even as they excel in different aspects of their work with God. And um, verse 8 to 9 really convicted me, and I thought it was key. I also shared it as um, part of my convictions of what I give. Verse 8 reads, it says, I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. You know, here we see Paul telling them, the church in Corinth, that they shouldn't give like it's a command. They shouldn't give out of compulsion. But the reason why they should be giving is a show of their 
sincereness in the love for Christ. And the question you have to ask yourself today is, when you give, do you, do you see it as um, a command or something you were told to do and hence you just have to comply? Mm -hmm. Or did you see it as a show of the sincereness of your love for Christ? Just the opportunity and just being thankful for the opportunity to be united with him and to be part of his kingdom. Mm -hmm. But verse 9 was really captivating because it says here, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's so convicting because I, I, I look at this, I'm like, Jesus Christ being the Son of God came as a very normal man. Mm -hmm. Someone who you wouldn't look up to or look, look at as someone special. Mm -hmm. Became poor for us so that we would be rich spiritually. And for me, when I give, this is what I think about, I realize that when our, our giving goes a long way, you know, in reaching different people, you know, making them spiritually rich by coming to the knowledge of the truth, and hence uniting with Christ. Mm -hmm. You understand? It, it goes a long way. And I'm, I'm, I'm a product of that because, you know, due to the fact that a lot of disciples contributed around the world, the church in Lagos was planted in 2016. Mm -hmm. I became a disciple, studied the Bible in 2018. Mm -hmm. And it was, and hence became, you know, spiritually rich because I now came to know God. Yeah. And a lot of us can attest to that, that for for the people who met us in different places we were met, it was as a result of disciples contributing and hence churches being planted in these different places. Even recently, um, just about two weeks ago, Mark in Uganda, our brother, you know, he, he, he recently just became spiritually rich too as he was united with Christ in the waters of baptism. But that was only possible because our brothers and sisters in the DC church Right, we're able to contribute towards the logistics needs need, needed for our brother Ezekiel in Lira, which is about six to seven hours away from Kampala, where Mark was, to travel down there and get him um, united with Christ. Mm -hmm. That goes a long way to show you how our contribution brings people to the knowledge of the truth, hence mm -hmm. making them spiritually rich. Mm -hmm. At this time, I want my wonderful wife to share um, our convictions on giving to. Mm -hmm. Thanks, babe. Uh, thank you, Andrew and Patrick, for giving us the opportunity to share our hearts on contribution. You know, during this time, there's a lot of global needs during this time of tragedy. But in reality, the most tragic experience that any of us could ever experience is not having a relationship with God. And it's because of that truth that I'm really grateful to be a part of a church an international group of churches that are working together to advance the gospel not only in you know the area in which we are located but around the world you know because of the contribution of the brothers and sisters here in South Africa as well as around the world we've been able to go into the homes of many men and women during this time of lockdown through WhatsApp and Zoom and you know, it's amazing because if it wasn't for the contribution of those that love God before anything else, we wouldn't be able to do this. We've been able to reach people in Uganda, Kenya, Malawi, uh, Rwanda, and I'm sure there are many other countries that will come out, you know, with people who are seeking the truth, who didn't have the opportunity before. You know, because of the contributions that is taken up, we're able to even send money out, you know, to those who don't have the financial ability to buy data, to study the Bible. But because of the sacrifices of many, we've been able to contribute in that way so that they can receive the saving gospel through Bible studies, through the Internet. You know, I think about a young woman who's with us right now, Destiny. You know, she's currently located in Uganda. You know, coming from a Pentecostal background, she was enslaved to false doctrinal teachings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, since the lockdown, she's been able to study the Bible and her life is being transformed because she's learning the truth from the gospel and really developing a relationship with God. This is just one of many examples of women and men who are being saved because of the contribution of many around the world. You know, I want to talk to my amazing sisters and, you know, just ask you, when you give your contribution, do you acknowledge that you are sowing into the lives of women around the world who are suffering? 
Like, do you know just how much of an impact your giving is doing for the advancement of the gospel? I know for me, when I think about it, it brings me joy when I send in my contribution to know that God is giving me, giving us an opportunity to be a part of such a special, amazing experience. Yeah. The experience of knowing our Creator and thus being healed from many pains of our past. Just so grateful to God for all that he's doing. And thank you so much for allowing me to share. Amen. <laughs> Wonderful, babe. Thanks, babe. Um, I, we want you to take two key things from this. Mm -hmm. First, when you give, give not out of compulsion or like it's a command, yeah. but give to show the sincerity of your love for Christ. Mm -hmm. Just seeing how, how, how thankful you are for the opportunity to be part of this. Mm -hmm. And secondly, just realize that just as Jesus Christ gave you know everything becoming poor so we could be rich spiritually because we're united with him mm -hmm. that should also convict you when you give seeing how far it goes mm -hmm. in making people spiritually rich mm -hmm. by coming to the knowledge of the truth and hence uniting with christ mm -hmm. i pray you're convicted and i pray as you give you think about these things and reflect on it let's pray mm -hmm. dear father we're grateful for the opportunity lord to to be part of this lord to to, to give in your kingdom, oh Lord. I, I mean, who are we mm -hmm. that you've counted us worthy to know your truth? Mm -hmm. And you've counted us worthy to participate in this um, free gift, Lord. Mm -hmm. um, and we're grateful, Father, for just this opportunity, Lord. I pray that even, oh Lord, as we've shared our hearts, Lord, on what con um, contribution means to us, oh Lord, other disciples, you know, watching this are also convicted, oh Lord, yeah. to, to understand that giving is, is is a privilege and it's a show of our gratitude and also it goes a long way in bringing people to the knowledge of the truth father mm -hmm. be with us at this time accept our gift father it it means nothing to you but at the end is the heart you're after mm -hmm. and i pray we're able to give with sincere heart of love be with us at this time and take control of the remaining part of the service lord when in jesus mighty name i pray amen Good morning, family. I hope this message finds you well as we begin the second half of our series in the book of Revelation. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to recognize the South African holiday of Youth Day this week, which honors and pays tribute to the memory of brave school children who lost their lives protesting against a law that made uh, the Afrikaans language compulsory in black schools back in 1976. Sadly, South Africa has a history of disunity and racial tension that has resulted in the deaths of blacks and whites to the present day. Although the vision of having a, a peaceful and prosperous rainbow nation has had many challenges, I, I believe with all my heart that the secret to true unity starts and ends with a commitment to the word of God. Please start with me in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6. The Republic of South Africa, like the United States, is a country composed of several cultures, 11 official languages to be exact, with the vision of these diverse people uniting to work together despite a history of violence. You, ultimately, this vision is, is bound to fail if it's based solely on the sinful character of man, no matter how brave or heroic the efforts to bring democracy to this great nation. The future of South Africa can be bright if its people humble themselves and remember that they are a nation first under God's sovereignty and power. I believe the first step to really achieving this vision for racial unity is realizing that our struggle is more than a battle between each other. Let's read here in Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to pick it up in verse 10. The Bible reads, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. 
In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. You know, I appreciate the Apostle Paul really inspiring the church here in Ephesus while he was in prison himself. And so the title of the message today is simply Satan's schemes will not prevail. You know, as disciples of Jesus, we must be strong in the Lord and not in our political or racial ideology. We stand firm against Satan's schemes, as the scriptures say here, by equipping ourselves with the armor of God, not a gun or a machete. Hatred and murder will not accomplish the vision of South Africa, but rather the gospel of peace that is taught through the word of God and prayer. Every Christian must be a fearless ambassador to make known the mystery of the gospel. Well, what's that? That all peoples can be united and be heirs of salvation through the blood of Jesus. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6. Only through the church do we have the power to achieve this miracle, to love God and love each other. That's why the Apostle Paul states in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. At this time of racial tension and disunity in the world, where are you getting your wisdom from? The internet? Social media? Or are you holding to the word of God, the inspired word of God? You know, sadly, I've seen disciples more interested in, in voicing their personal opinions in social media rather than proclaiming the scriptures. So how, how does a church express this abundant wisdom of God? Turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Don't worry, we're going to get to Revelation soon. <laughs> Galatians chapter 3. The Bible says here in verse 26, Galatians 3 verse 26, You are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You know, the diverse unity of the church shows the world that every person is equal at the foot of the cross. Every baptized disciple understands that Jesus died for all so that we would die to our sins and live for him. There's no favoritism in the church based on our race or socioeconomic status, job, or gender. If you claim to be a Christian, do you believe this with all your heart or has it started to change over time? Let's examine the Apostle Peter's heart as he spoke to Cornelius, uh, a prominent Italian centurion who had invited him over to his home. Let's turn with me over to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Let's pick it up here in verse 34. Here, again, Peter is in Cornelius' home, which was against the Jewish law to do being with a Gentile, right? But here, Peter understood from the, his visions before that this was what was right. Acts 10, verse 34, Bible reads, Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know, it's interesting here that Peter understood God's conviction on racial unity and took bold and, and faithful steps to bring the Gentiles into the kingdom of God. Yet, despite his convictions for radical unity in Christ, 
even the Apostle Peter fell into the trap of sentimentality and allowed his love for others of a different race to grow cold. We can learn these lessons as well. Turn me over to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Let's pick it up here in verse 11. The Bible reads, and now again, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the churches in Galatia about his interaction with Peter. Galatians chapter 2, picking it up in verse 11. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, from Jerusalem, Jewish disciples, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, quote unquote, know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Wow. So what do we see here? About 10 to 15 years after being used by God powerfully to help the Gentiles enter the church, the apostle Peter, the leader of Jesus' disciples, the apostle to the Jews, succumbed to prejudice and segregated himself from the Gentile Christians. If he can do that, how much more is there a temptation for us to fall into the same trap in regards to losing our love for each other. The Apostle Paul had to rebuke him for, for even leading other key Jewish leaders like Barnabas into the same sins. The Bible shows us that the human heart remains the same over thousands of years. And racial disunity is one of Satan's key schemes to deceive and destroy God's people. Well, where are you this morning? When is the last time you've, you've considered your actions and, and determined whether the love in your heart has grown cold towards others? Are, are you acting in line with the truth of the gospel? Jesus gives us some, an important admonition about this issue back in Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, let's pick it up here in verse 10. And th these, are, these are key issues we, we're going to be addressing even as we continue to study Revelation here. Matthew 24, let's pick it up in verse 10. The Bible reads here, Jesus states to his disciples, At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Wow. We stand firm against Satan's schemes by loving others to the end. You know, this decision, our decision about this is a matter of salvation. That's what Jesus states here. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as well as the members of the first and century church, understood this. As they faced death at the hands of their Roman and Jewish persecutors. Consider the last words of Jesus at his crucifixion in Luke 23, 34. He states, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. As he dying on the cross. Consider the last words of Stephen as he was being stoned by the members of the Jewish Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 7, verse 60. He states, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. That is love to the end. That is the heart of a disciple. Even in the midst of death, 
Jesus and Stephen loved their enemies. <sighs> that is a, a tall order to imitate. And Satan, knowing this, is working hard to make us hate each other and be deceived by the increase of wickedness in the world today. But, but no matter the state of the world, as Christians, we must stand firm in love and not in hate. That is how we take our stand against the devil's schemes, not by giving in to our carnal nature of hatred and retaliation, by walking in step with the Spirit through love and forgiveness. You know, my heart um, has been heavy this week. Um, I just took some time to, to research the history of South Africa and, and the various atrocities that have occurred to both whites and blacks. The horrific murders of of white farmers and their children recently just drove me to my knees in prayer. I was grateful to speak to a dear Afrikaans brother in our church who shared how both his uncle and nephew had been murdered. These tragedies are the schemes of, of Satan to take us down a dark path of, of bitterness and resentment rather than the hope and the faith that is available in the kingdom of God, his church. It also reminded me of how Satan works and how he worked behind the scenes um, for the first murder in the Bible. He used the sins of, our, of Cain to develop into murder for his brother Abel. Let's pick it up in Genesis chapter 4. In Genesis chapter 4, let's pick it up here, starting in verse 1. It's good to understand the story here. In Genesis 4, starting in verse 1, the Bible reads, Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother, Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. <clears throat> Today, you are driving me from the land and I'll be hidden from your presence. I'll be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Wow. So what do we see here? Brother killing brother. And for what? Uh, Cain, a farmer, killed his brother Abel, also a farmer or a shepherd, because of the favor that Abel had received. Although the Lord had warned Cain beforehand in verse six to, to recognize his bitterness and acknowledge how his unrepentant sin would master him, Cain's unresolved anger turned to resentment and eventually murder. This was all part of Satan's wicked schemes. And you know, as I consider the situation in South Africa today, there, there's nothing new under the sun. Brother kills brother because of sin. Look at the outcome of Abel's murder. Did the Lord strike down Cain where he stood? He knew what he did. 
No, he didn't. Instead, he informed him that he was cursed, while also protecting him from being murdered by others. Wow. In verse 15, it states here that God would bring suffering, bring vengeance seven times on those who would try to kill Cain. That's, that's intense. Are you harboring any hatred in your heart today towards the present racial situation here in South Africa? Don't forget the promise of God. In Romans 12, 19, God will avenge those who have suffered and repay the evil of the wicked. The scripture here in Genesis reminds us that those who are wicked are already under God's curse. Do not fall into the trap of retaliation and suffer God's vengeance seven times over. We must see how Satan's schemes work through the sin of our hearts. Take a look over in 2 Corinthians 2. 2 Corinthians 2. Satan's schemes will not prevail if we're focused on obeying the word of God. 2 Corinthians 2, take a look in verse 9 here. Again, the Apostle Paul is speaking to the church here in Corinth, and he reads, I read, verse 9, The reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. What do we see here about standing firm against Satan's schemes? We, we stand firm by seeing the test and being obedient in everything, even when we don't want to forgive. Don't let Satan outsmart you. His major scheme is to, to take our justified anger due to the sins of others and allow that anger to remain unresolved to the point where bitterness and resentment grow. And now we are in sin. You know, Ephesians 4 lays this out for us here. Ephesians 4 lays this out. I'm coming to Revelation, I promise you. I'll be right after this. But Ephesians 4 lays this out. And I, wanna, I wanted to give you a little background here that's so important. Because we got to have deep conviction about this topic. Especially as we're dealing with the cultural challenges today. Ephesians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul is speaking here to the church in Ephesus. And he says here, starting in verse 22. He says, You were taught in regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to make new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. See, that, that's what happens. That's what happens when we allow unresolved anger to turn into resentment and bitterness. We give the devil a foothold in the church, in our hearts. That's his scheme all along. Let's pick it up in verse 29. The Bible reads, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. You know, I was, I was setting this out for my quiet time earlier today, and it's interesting. The word unwholesome means rotten, putrid, something that divides and cuts. It's destructive, not constructive. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not, do not call the, cause the Holy Spirit to have pain. That's what it means. With whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Remember we learned that back in Revelation. <laughs> Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ 
God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. <laughs> what a powerful scripture. Well, when we allow bitterness and, and rage to reign in our hearts, any hope of healing will stop. We must forgive as Jesus forgave us. But this is by no means easy. As we examined last week in chapters 10 and 11 of Revelation, we must be willing to accept the whole Bible. Not just the parts that satisfy our emotions, especially when it comes to forgiveness and mercy. I know for me, um, that's not always easy. But a script that really helps me is 1 Peter chapter 1, 6, and 7 that it reminds me that through trials, my faith is proven genuine. And my mother always used to say to me that people are like tea bags. You don't know what they're made of until they're put in hot water. Then all the flavor starts coming on out. You know, during this time of racial disunity across the world today, what's the flavor of your heart? What, what's being revealed? in your character. You know, suffering reveals our hearts. Either we learn to love like Christ, or we learn to hate like the devil. Either we entrust the wickedness of the world to God's judgment, or we give in to prejudice and want to inflict our own judgment. Now, let's get into our main text today. Turn over to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Let's pick it up here, starting in verse 1. Revelation chapter 12, starting in verse 1. The Bible reads, A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. On his heads, his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Gotta love that apocalyptic literature right there. All right, point number one today, if you haven't had enough points already. <laughs> Satan's schemes will not prevail if we endure the pain to bear the character of Christ in our lives. Satan's schemes will not prevail if we endure the pain to bear the character of Christ in our lives lives. Chapter 12 here begins the second half of our series in the book of Revelation as a flashback to the reasons for the first century church's persecution that we examined back in chapters 1 through 11. The battle of righteousness versus evil has been in existence before Adam entered the world. And since his disobedience to God, every soul is involved. Even though the Bible states that we begin life at an innocent state, Ecclesiastes 7.29 Ezekiel 28, 15. At some point, we give ourselves over to our sinful nature and volunteer to be used by the devil. Now, Satan is a master manipulator, and so he, he seeks to destroy us by, by deceiving us that, that giving into our sinful nature is in our best interests. But he'll be defeated if we're aware of his schemes. Well, as we look behind the scenes here to the underlying causes of persecution for the first century church, the Apostle John tells us, shows us a vision with a pregnant woman in heaven clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, a crown of 12 stars on her head. Of course, we know by now that this is apocalyptic literature, symbolic in nature that refers back to the Old Testament. And in order to encourage the first century church, the woman's description reminds us of Joseph's dream in Genesis chapter 37. Verse 9 to 11. In that account, God 
uh, is exalting Joseph over his family. And in both that scripture and here in Revelation, the 12 stars represent the 12 tribes of Israel. So in effect, the Jewish nation was chosen to give birth to Jesus in, in a corporate sense. Um, just as the Virgin Mary was chosen um, in a specific sense. You could study that out, of course, in Luke 1, 31 and Galatians 4, 4. Um, that, it makes it clear there. So the woman, which represents God's people, is in the pains of childbirth. And as I thought about this, it reminded me of the Apostle Paul's admonition to the Galatian churches in Galatians chapter 4. Let's turn there. Galatians chapter 4. Let's pick it up in verse 19. He says here, Galatians 4, 19, My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I'm perplexed about you. Amen. Are you in the pains of childbirth this morning as you struggle to give birth to the character of Christ in your life? You know, becoming like Jesus is a painful process because we're getting molded through the, the trials of life to respond like him instead of reacting because through our sinful nature. At the same time, we face pressure from the world to alienate us from God. So we're tempted to reject the truth in order to please ourselves. Look what Paul actually states back up in verse 15 of Galatians 4. He says here, what has happened to all your joy? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may be zealous for them. Whoa. Okay. That's interesting. Has your joy in Christ be because, or rather, have you lost your joy in Christ because of the pains of being molded to become more like him? The world is eager to win you over to their ideology instead of becoming more like Christ. Is your identity still in Christ or something else? To whom do you pledge your allegiance? As disciples of Christ, we are citizens in the kingdom of God first and foremost, not our race or our culture. Do not let your culture supersede your calling in Christ. I believe there's another reason why God used apocalyptic literature um, to, to help us understand these things back in Revelation chapter 12. Um, he used it obviously to symbolize his people as a woman and the child being Christ to encourage the first century church. But it's interesting that the first messianic prophecy occurs in Genesis chapter 3 after the devil, um, in the form of a serpent, deceived Eve and Adam into disobeying God. Let's flip back there quickly. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Picking it up here in verse 14. The Bible reads, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly. You will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Okay, so here we see that the seed of the woman, a messianic prophecy of Jesus, would overcome Satan's plans um, through his victory at the cross, although the devil would have him pay a high price. It's remarkable just to see how the apocalyptic literature in Revelation goes all the way back to Genesis, just to make its point and encourage the first century church. Well, let's get back to Revelation 12. In Revelation 12, we saw in verse 3 that we see this huge red dragon, of course, uh, symbolizing the devil, who was trying hard to, to kill this male child, which we know is Jesus. Satan is pictured here as one with great wisdom, seven heads, great power, ten horns, great authority, seven crowns. And so you may remember from our earlier studies of symbolic numbers in Revelation that the number seven represents perfection and is normally descriptive of God or godly attributes. The application of Satan in this passage 
shows the capabilities he has. His tail sweeping stars out of heaven portrays his incredible power. Matthew 2, 13 to 18, shows us that Satan's power was to devour Jesus at his birth. And with the help of Herod, he devoured many children in his attempt to kill Jesus. In verse 5 here, we see that Jesus is born and will rule the nations, as prophesied in Psalms chapter 2, verse 7 to 9. After the cross and the ascension of Jesus, the new covenant begins, at which represents the child being snatched up to God and his throne. The woman in verse 6 now represents the church of the new covenant, the body of Christ on earth, enduring the quote-unquote wilderness, wilderness wandering in the desert for 1,260 days, which we understand is just a time of persecution. So what do we get from all this? Well, we need to understand that and trust that while God is sovereign and in control, we will endure many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Acts 14, 22. The battle is not against flesh and blood. And we, but we can stand firm if we remain humble and before him. And remember that God believes in us. He's not going to give us more than what we can bear. Take a look over at 1 Corinthians here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You know, some people think that becoming a Christian or staying a Christian is easy. That ain't the truth. Let's see what the Apostle Paul has to say about this to the Corinthian disciples. Let's pick it up here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 and 13. The Bible reads, So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Amen. You know, perhaps this morning, you think, oh, I'm standing firm in all this stuff you've been talking about. Well, I hope you're doing it not on your own strength. You see, the good news is that God did not give us more than what we can bear. I don't know what trials or temptations you're going through this morning. But I believe that if we take our stand against Satan's schemes by putting on that armor of righteousness, keeping a heart of love to the end, and being obedient through the test, we will prevail we will be able to stand up under the struggle. Let's get back to Revelation. Keep going. Revelation, <clears throat> chapter 12, picking it up in verse 7. The Bible states, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to earth, and his angels were with him. And his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ for the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. Point number two today, Satan's schemes will not prevail if we fight to be faithful. Remember that Revelation 12 is a flashback for the reasons um, of persecution in the first century church. This section is not a literal record of Satan's original origin as a fallen angel, right? But a vision of Satan being unable to prevail against the spiritual forces of righteousness. It, it's a focus on the power of God over the devil as a way to encourage the first century church and us today. Sometimes as disciples, we can wonder why God allows the devil to have such an amazing amount of power. The spiritual world is locked in a, in, a, in a battle of good and evil, although we're basically not aware of it. Satan is alive. He's active and he's fighting for souls on earth. But this scripture reminds us who the champion in this fight will be. If the devil could not defeat the archangel Michael, then he'll surely be annihilated by God. The battle's already lost for him. 
We also have to remember that the church is both a family and an army of God. Are you fighting the good fight of faith? This passage reminds us that the schemes of the devil, he has a, a plan for spiritual warfare. What is his plan? Well, verse 9 tells us that he's a deceiver that leads the whole world astray. He makes the innocent feel guilty and the guilty feel innocent. In verse 11, we also see that Satan is an accuser, eager to fill us with self-doubt and also to doubt in God's love for us. Some of us are especially vulnerable to Satan's accusations, always feeling guilty and down on ourselves. Others of us are, don't struggle too much with having an accused conscience, but we're deceived about our spiritual condition. Those who are guilty souls often feel guilt when they're not, and others feel innocent when they're not. All of this is deception from the devil. This passage even relates to the current racial situation in the world today, as many, many whites, and even a lot of my white friends, have felt guilty about the past sins of their fathers. Now, while the past should make us grieve about the reality of how wicked men can be, this notion of quote unquote white guilt can create souls that constantly feel accused and unloved. There needs to be a godly sorrow that seeks to make things right, but not a worldly sorrow of self-pity and despair. Satan also tries to lead blacks astray as, as a notion of black fury or black exploitation that was expressed in 70s movies that, that, that gave the stereotype as of black men being wild and violent because of past injustices. That's got to stop. That, that stereotype's got to stop. The angry black man stereotype. Fury is of the devil and not of God. That's just wild and violent anger. That's not of God. Are you filled with guilt or fury today? So how do we overcome these schemes of Satan? How do we overcome his attacks on our hearts? Verse 11 gives us the answer. We must be secure in Christ by remembering Jesus' love on the cross for us. We must give our testimony by preaching the word daily about the hope we have in Christ. We must have the courage to endure suffering, even to the point of death, because we know this life is just the beginning. Take a look over in Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16 is just a great passage here. We will overcome if we seek to obey God's word and not our own opinions. Proverbs 16, verse 6, the Bible reads, Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Through the fear of the Lord, a man avoids evil. You see, Satan wants to use our struggle to make us give in to evil instead of avoiding it. We must fear God more than we fear the injustices of this world. Does love and faithfulness describe your heart today towards your brothers and sisters? Turn back to Revelation chapter 12. We're going we're to close out our message today in just a moment. Revelation chapter 12. My last point, I'm going to give you right after you finish reading this. Revelation 12, picking it up in verse 13. The Bible reads, When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time, out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. <laughs> Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commands, commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Amen. Last point today. Satan's schemes will not prevail if we recognize that our individual righteousness makes a difference. Satan will not prevail if we recognize that our individual righteousness makes a difference. You know, sometimes people think they can just go to church and because the church is awesome, then they don't have to be awesome. They don't actually have to work hard to be holy and to be righteous. That's a lie from the devil. 
We all have to guard our hearts so that Satan does not take a foothold in this church. You know, here in verse 13, we see that the church, depicted here as a woman, has become the sole focus for Satan's attention. The apocalyptic literature in verse 14 and 15 encourages us that the Lord provides the protection needed to stay out of Satan's reach. The water, like a river, spewed out from Satan is a river of lies that he used to drown the church in false doctrines. We see that a lot today. But the church refused to be deceived. One of the reasons that the disciples did not fall into the trap of these lies is because the earth swallowed them. <laughs> the religious world swallows up all these different false doctrines as well as the world. So what does all this mean? Well, essentially the world followed Satan's lies at this time. To the extent that Christians could see the futility and the emptiness of wicked living. And we see that today too. You know, it, it's pretty obvious when you look at the rape and the murder and the stealing and the suicide in the world and you realize Jesus has got to be the only way, the only truth, the only life. This world doesn't get it. There is no hope without God for this world. Verse 17 shows us that since the devil was unable to destroy the church as a whole, the woman, he now he targets individual Christians the rest of her offspring, right? So both, both God and Satan know that the eternal battle for souls is, is won or lost one person at a time, one day at a time. Whoever wins the daily battles will win the war. Are you consistent in the spiritual battle for righteousness? I always encourage your brothers in the church about making sure that their spiritual quote-unquote chair of Christianity is solid. It has four legs. <laughs> and if you remove one, you're going you're gonna to fall. Essentially, it's the daily diet of a disciple that, that gives us the strength to defeat Satan in the same way our first century brothers and sisters did. Essentially, the four things are, number one, daily Bible study. Acts 17, verse 11. Scriptures are clear. Number two, daily prayer. Psalms 5, 1 to 3. Number three, Daily openness with our lives, James 5, 16. And the last, daily evangelism, Acts 17, 16 to 17. How are you doing in being consistent in that spiritual diet? Or have you allowed Satan to start to get into your heart because you've lost being consistent? Imagine people say, you know, <laughs> I, I kind of laugh sometimes because I think what if 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 you're watching us, watching this today, ask yourself, am I really committed to being a daily Christian? Imagine if you didn't brush your teeth every day or take your bath or shower every day. People think by going to church once a week, now they're good to go. That's like taking a bath or brushing your teeth once a week. Is that going to work for you? It's ridiculous. No wonder Satan has such control in their lives. But do you believe that how you live your spiritual life matters? Remember that Satan is targeting both the church and every individual disciple of Jesus. So don't give Satan a foothold into the kingdom of God because you lack the commitment to obey God's commandments and a hold to the testimony of Jesus. God wants you to shine like a star. And, and so that Satan's schemes will not prevail. Is it going to be easy? No, of course not. But if we persevere to the end, we will prevail. Let's close as we examine the heart of the prophet Jeremiah, an ordinary man who understood the, the physical and emotional suffering as he preached the word of God to a stubborn nation. Maybe we can get and learn a lot from what he has to state as well. Take a look over in Jeremiah chapter 20. We're going to end here. Jeremiah chapter 20, starting in verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 20. We see here Jeremiah's complaint. <laughs> and that's the temptation, isn't it? The temptation will be there, but the question is, will we overcome? I believe we will, just like Jeremiah did as well. Take a look. Jeremiah chapter 20, starting in verse 7. The Bible reads, Oh Lord, you deceived me, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say, I will not mention him or speak anymore in his name, 
His word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. It's interesting here. He goes on in verse 10. I hear many whispering, terror on every side. Report him. Let's report him. All my friends are waiting for me to slip, saying, perhaps he'll be deceived. Then we can prevail over him and take our revenge on him. Verse 11. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. So my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fail and be thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. O oh Lord Almighty, you who examine the righteous and probe the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance upon them. For to you, I have committed my cause. <laughs> Amen. You see just how he worked through his heart there. It's a struggle, but we can prevail if we deal with our heart, deal with our minds. Have you committed your cause to the Lord this morning or have you lost your joy? and have a complaining heart toward the Lord. We can all struggle. We can all complain in our hearts like Jeremiah did, but we need to fight like he did to be faithful. We need to keep that fire burning in our hearts through our daily commitment to God and his kingdom, the church. Do not be deceived by the great deceiver. Satan has already lost. He's just looking to take people with him to hell. Are you with me here? He will not prevail if we fight to be God's mighty warriors. May the Lord find us righteous when he examines our hearts and our minds. Well, if you need this morning to be your best for God, contact us, joebergicc.net. We'll be happy to help so you can learn more. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for taking the time to fight for your heart to be holy, for your heart to be righteous. May God heal your heart, our hearts, as he also heals this land. May God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our worship service. And we pray that you enjoyed it and that it moved you to do things that for God that you have never done before. And uh, we're so grateful to our uh, couple, uh, Jacques and Jeanette, that shared so powerfully about how they were before they became disciples of Christ and how they are now. And how through their commitment and through faith that they were able to repent and change their way of thinking. And Jacques shared that, you know, God, Jesus came to destroy the barrier the wall of hostility. And Jock shared that his hostility was shown through his prejudice. And that before he was a disciple, he held prejudice against people of other colors. And now, since he has become a true disciple of Christ, he has repented of that prejudice. And I can honestly say that Jock is one of my best friends here in the kingdom of God. And it just goes to show the power that God has to change lives. He changed Jock's life. He showed Jock that he must have a heart that's inclusive of all people, of all races, and all nationalities. Thank you so much, Jock, for being open and sharing about that because it's important for us to know that if we can change, anyone can change. If they have faith in Jesus Christ. And his wife, Jeanette, shared about how she grew up during the time when apartheid was being abolished and how it was just a, an ecstatic time in South Africa. But now she feels that there's reverse racism and she has to deal with that. But as a disciple, she knows that she can make a change she can change people's hearts by showing the word of God, by showing them that Jesus came to destroy that barrier of hostility and how she's not going to let that change her convictions about being sold out for Jesus Christ and sharing the word of God to anyone, no matter what color race they are. Thank you so much, Jeanette and Jacques 
for sharing and being so open about how you were before becoming a disciple and how you are as a result of making Jesus Lord and Savior of your life. And then we had a couple, Osas and Ariel, that shared about contribution and how Jesus wants us to have a heart of love when we give our offering. He doesn't want us to give out of compulsion. He wants us to give out of gratitude, gratitude for what he's done for us. And to show that gratitude, we want to do the same for others. And in order to make that happen, it takes money. We need to send people throughout the world in order to share the good news about Jesus Christ because everyone, everyone has, needs to have the opportunity to know Jesus. And in order to send out the missionaries throughout the world, it takes money and it takes a heart to give. It takes a heart to give that enables others to do that work. And we thank you so much, Ariel and Osas, for uh, showing us the heart that we need to have and how God does not want our money if we're giving it grudgingly. He wants us to give out of sincerity, with a sincere heart and out of love. Thank you so much, Osas and Ariel. Andrew, amazing job. I really, really enjoy this series in Revelations. We just finished the first half of Revelations. Now we're into the second half. And you touched on and you talked about Revelations chapter 12. And as I read Revelations chapter 12, it was just amazing to see how Michael and his angels fought against Satan and his angels in heaven and how the the devil was thrown down to the earth along with his angels to wreak havoc in the world and how he came after the woman that gave birth to the male child. And that woman is his church here on earth and how the devil is really, really going after the church. And the title of the lesson was Satan's schemes will not prevail. And that's so true. Satan's schemes will not pre prevail. And one of your points that stuck out to me was Satan's schemes will not prevail if we fight to be faithful. And I know every day it's a fight for me to be faithful, but I'm so glad that I have God's kingdom and his word to help strengthen me every day. And I need that strength every day. We need to understand that we need to have that passion that Satan is out to persecute us. Persecution will take us out if we're not faithful. God's plan is to build a kingdom, a kingdom that's a rainbow, a rainbow of people from different nationalities. But Satan wants to divide that. He wants to divide and conquer. God created a rainbow. And we need to embrace it and each other. But Satan wants to destroy the unity that God has envisioned for his church. Andrew, thank you so, so much for that lesson. And I'm so excited for uh, next week and uh, chapter 13. And I'm really going to hate when this series is over. But thanks to the vision and the that we have, it's going to be amazing. Thank you so much, and we'll have one last song. When trouble comes my way, when trouble comes my way, you gotta pray sometimes. You gotta pray sometimes. When trouble comes my way, when trouble comes my way, you gotta pray sometimes. You gotta pray sometimes. But don't you know that my Jesus? Jesus you know that my Jesus, Jesus is gonna fix it. Don't you know that my Jesus, Jesus is gonna fix it. After a while, after a while, when trouble comes my way, when trouble comes my way, you gotta fight sometimes. You gotta fight sometimes. When trouble comes my way, when trouble comes my way, you 
gotta fight some time. Don't you know that my Jesus? Jesus is gonna fix it. You know that my Jesus. Jesus is gonna fix oh, it. Oh, don't you know that my Jesus? Jesus is gonna fix it. After a while. After a while. Na 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 but don't you know that my Jesus, Jesus is gonna fix it. Know that my Jesus, Jesus is gonna fix it. But don't you know that my Jesus, Jesus is gonna fix it. After a while.